First of all, what a, you know, it's kind of mind-blowing, you know. I'm the guy that never went to, uh, uh, I skipped school all the time, and the Lord said, you don't spend most of the rest of your life in school. So I've spoken <laughs> four or five times a day, five days a week, for longer than I'm willing to admit. And uh, so don't mess with the Lord, you young guys out there, right? Do what he says and go where you're supposed to go. Last night was a tremendous night. And to receive that award from you uh, is, is very humbling. And especially after last night, the life of Dr. Naylor and what she had done in a part of the world where she didn't have a fraction of the, the, the luxuries and the help and the encouragement to think about what she's done, it's staggering. And I'm a, I went to Southwestern Seminary uh, longer than I wanted to. They just wouldn't let me go. They just wanted me to keep staying. And, uh, but uh, that, that name, Naylor, is a, a, a kind of a sacred name out there and in her life she is a rock star so thank you for the way you honored her and I'm blown away but thank you for the privilege of being here if you have your Bible I know some of us have it memorized but if you have your Bible uh, get out a pen pencil lipstick mascara or your phone okay I know it's always fun because Half the people in the church goes crazy that everybody's on their phone, but without the phone, uh, there's a lot of folks wouldn't be reading and hearing the Word of God. So it's a double-edged sword, amen, and FM. I want to talk to you a few moments this morning about reaching not the next gen, but the now gen. I'm going to ask you, just cross off that word Every time you see it, next gen, next gen, next gen. I'm telling you in, in my humble but accurate opinion that we are in the fourth quarter. And it is the bottom of the ninth. And the sand is almost out of the hourglass. And the final curtain's about to fall. There's only a few seconds on the shot clock. Whatever metaphor you're on, you like, well, let's see, we had the Bay Hill Invitational. Uh, so if you're approaching the 18th hole, I mean, I believe with all my heart, and I'm talking to men and women of God, many of which have been serving and serving and serving and serving. So you know the pulse. One of my favorite sayings, I'm going to ask you to write it down because I promise you you'll use it, especially next business meeting you have. But... Uh, the Lord has taught me to feel my muscle and quit feeling my pulse. There's so many things that we see on television. There's so many things that are said, so many slights, so many people that have let it, so, you know, all the stuff. And most of us, the reason we go through some of the things we go through, and I'm as guilty as anyone, we've been feeling our pulse and our pulse goes up and down. And our pulse races out of control. But if we could learn to feel our muscles. Now, when you're young, do it a lot, okay? Uh, but I want you to know, feel your muscle, not your pulse. Because ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm talking to the grown-ups. I'm talking to the big leaguers. I'm talking to men and women who've devoted your life to the kingdom so I don't have to sugarcoat anything. But I believe, having spent almost 50 years trying to reach the next generation, and I'm very grateful what many of those are now doing today. But I promise you in Kentucky and in Florida where I live, we must focus on the now generation. We've got to body slam some of the people in our church. We've got to have a come to Jesus moment. We've got to reach out and touch somebody. But I, I, I believe that if you and I don't walk out of here today realizing the whole show 
of everything we believe about our country, about the kingdom, about our part in the world, my prayer is you and I would walk out of here going, if it's to be, it's up to me. And I promise you, there was a saying in World War II, count the ammunition, right? Count it, keep count of how many bullets you have. Well, I'm telling you, we don't even have the luxury of counting how many bullets we have. So I'm not trying to be melodramatic, but with all my heart, what do I say to someone after this great honor? But I'm just simply convinced I'm going to spend whatever days I have left, but I'm focusing on the now generation. John chapter 10, verse 10. I'm going to speak on identity theft, and I'm going to give you several impressions as I crisscross the country and I keep my ear to the ground. Norman Rockwell has a great quote. He said, I keep my ear, well, he doesn't say it now, but he used to, I keep my ear so close to the ground, it's usually full of dirt. But I want us so let's look at what's going on. One simple phrase, identity theft. John chapter 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus tells us, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly, have it in fullness. Now, I want you to think with me a moment. What does the word steal mean? It means to intentionally take something that is not yours, that you have no right to, and you take it to yourself to do with what you want. That's a pretty powerful term when Jesus is describing the adversary, Satan, that he's going to take by force. Most of the majority, it's a little redundant, most of the majority, the majority of the time, you need to understand that when someone is called a thief, it literally means they have intentionally stolen something from somebody and they use it for whatever they want. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we hear a lot about plagiarism and it really is a big deal. And when you know the original meaning of that word, I promise you it's a big deal. Back in the days of the Romans, obviously slavery was a part of everyday life. And if there was a slave that worked for one of the very wealthy in Rome, in Italy, in the Roman Empire, well, they would treat that slave with, with a little more respect and then a little more respect and soon maybe honor. They begin to give him a small portion of the proceeds. And they would take that one or two, the one or two people on that estate. Now, still slavery is slavery. We know that. But this man who was working extra, extra, extra hard to earn the trust and the confidence, so he got a little more time off. He got a little bit more pay. And do you know he would soon have the ability maybe even to buy a small parcel of land from the owner. And he would be allowed to even have his own crop. And oftentimes, you know, the, being a slave, you, you know, you know what all's going on, and at least our master's not near as bad as that master, right? And so sometimes they'd talk to others in other plantations or other estates, as they would call them in Rome. And eventually... They would hear of somebody that had it so much worse. And so, but that one guy, that one individual served was so, just gave so much that he would take his money extra and would try to buy that person and make him part of their estate. And so he would give that guy a piece of the pie himself. Now, if somebody came in the middle of the night and stole that individual, we're talking about the individual that you were doing everything you could do to help him have a better life. You're a slave also, right? They not only steal that person away in the night, 
take him from his family, and he's gone. And the person that had spent all they had for that person to be able to come and let's do this together, not only did he lose that money, not only does it mean obviously the person he thought was going to be an asset to him and was such a good person, he was gone, no telling what the circumstances, but guess what? Whoever stole that person, they put that person to work for them, and they continued to make money off the person that somebody else had invested in. Now, you and I hate slavery, and obviously, it's a sin, it's one of the most hideous sins of our nation. I don't know how we'll ever, ever undo, but all we can do is move on and realize we're all in this together, amen? But I want you to understand, plagiarism is when I take something you've worked hard on, you've worked for, you've spent hours, you've gone, you've done the research, you wrote the book, you wrote the song, you, you came up with it, and then I take something that belongs to you, and guess what? I now prop, not only are you out the money, but I'm now what? I'm doing good at your expense. So plagiarism, when you, well, I love word studies because I'm dyslexic and I'm ADDD. They added about three other Ds, I think, just to be cute. But I want you to know, I need to know what a word means. Because my dyslexia, I can't even read my own writing. And so I have to really work hard to understand what words mean. That word steal, the thief comes and he takes by force and he's motivated only by his own greed and desire to destroy and to hurt. He's come to steal, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. And the interesting thing about the word destroy in John 10.10 10, it literally means also to, you know, we think about, well, the bomb destroyed the building or the, the, the battle destroyed the village or the town. We obviously, we know the stro destroy, it means to put in ruins. But whenever it's applied to a person, the thief has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. We're talking about people. And therefore, the meaning of this word would be, in the original, and I, I don't want to brag, but having taken Koine Greek about four times, uh, I kind of am an expert, all right? So according to the original grammatical construction of the sentence is he has not only come to steal and to kill, but to completely ruin somebody's emotional state and spiritual state. It's not just stealing money. It's not just stealing a, a bicycle or stealing a motorcycle or stealing a car. No, no. It's stealing part of their soul. The reason I, as I said, Lord, what can I say to these men and women of God that have been serving you is I just felt like you and I need to take a fresh look at what's going on, what we read every day, what we're seeing on the, on the news and realize it's time, it's time for us to put the pads on. And it's time for us to say, Lord, here am I, like we've never said before. Jesus said, I want them to have life. I want them to have more abundantly. There's a phrase I came up with. I'm kind of proud of it, so I hope you like it. But the pickpocket of souls is Satan. He is such a coward. He'll sneak up and take this and take that. He'll take your honor a little bit, a piece at a time. And he'll take your virtue a little bit at a time. And he tries to get bites out of your soul. So the pickpocket of our souls are trying to steal three things to everybody you preach to and their children and their grandchildren and the future of this nation and the future of the kingdom of God. Listen to me. He steals their identity. We got young people don't even know who they are. They don't even know what they are. I was speaking at a big FCA conference recently, uh, statewide, 
uh, all the F FCA uh, students and their leaders, of course, and the athletes, all the various sports and all those schools. And so I, I made a statement. I said, you know, this stuff is real simple. You don't have to grow up on a farm or grow up on a ranch, Kentucky, to know that you can't get milk from a bull. Now, I'm not the brightest guy, you know. I was turned down by 13 colleges. I was told my senior year I wouldn't be able to graduate. They take role. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> Go figure, you know. So, but I, I, I want you to know that we have made such basic things and that have the audacity they want to make it that you're being argumentative or you're being difficult or you're being judgmental when all you're trying to do is save a generation. He wants to steal our identity. He wants to steal our and their reputation. And of course, Satan wants to steal the future of our kids. Ladies and gentlemen, I was a 17-year-old meth addict, six broken homes, six detention centers, uh, six foster homes, so 666 makes me nervous, whether I'm looking in the rearview mirror or I'm thinking about the future, right? I do believe there's going to be a beast. I sometimes wondering, wonder how old he is right now uh, in our country. Some believe now it may even be AI, but I want you to know and understand that you and I have one responsibility, and take it from the kid that had no father, no family, no future, and no faith. Somebody had to pray for me individually. Now, a lot of people think see you at the poll started at our high school. I don't know, but I know this. I know the Jesus movement when I got out of the detention center about November and I went back to school a couple days after I got out uh, and I go back to school and there's several people that have been saved in the Jesus movement. And I have people telling me for the first time in my life, man, I've been praying for you. Where have you been? I've been praying for you. We need you. And I kept going, what do you need me for? You got the biggest mouth in the school. We want the whole school to know about Jesus. It's nice to be wanted and appreciated for talents and skill. And there was this little geeky guy, bless his heart, named Charlie Thompson, wore his pants up to here. You know, I mean, you know, you try to help him be cool. I mean, but anyway, <laughs> he prayed for me day after day, night after night. He had been saved almost four months. He prayed, showed me where he prayed for me every day by name. So I want to just remind all of us in ministry, pray, well, I'm praying for the high school. Come on. If you're not praying by name, the one thing the Lord has shown me, and like some of you, I've been doing this a long time, and I believe I'm really seeing something for the first time. I believe that what made Jesus not only the life giver and life abundant and, and, and all that he was, and we know who he is, you know, God in the flesh, but Jesus was personal. Jesus made it his goal not just to speak to the masses. And what good does it do to speak to a stadium or, or an auditorium full of people and we walk right by one of those helping park the cars? I was asked the other day, Dr. J, what's, what's your, next big, your next big project? What's the next big thing? And I looked at him and I said, man, that's a great question. Can I let you in on something? The Lord is showing me I don't need to be worrying about the next big thing. I just better capture the moment. And you know what the moment is? One time, man, I had a meeting. You know what it's like? You got an important meeting. I was trying to get a new project off the ground. Willow Creek had, you know, back when Willow Creek was Willow Creek, they flew into Orlando, 
So I arranged for us to meet in a suite, a suite at the Orlando Magic game, and they'd come in, and man, they were going to be able to put what I was dreaming about on the map because of who they were, right? And so, man, I'm, man, I'm tearing, and, but I'm late. And I get there about 15 minutes late, and there was always a gentleman who saved a parking space for me, but I was so late, I was sure he'd be gone. And I pulled, come tearing in there, and there he was waiting. And I said, man, thanks for being here. He said, I was about to give up. I said, man, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really late. And, you know, I, I gave him a tip and I just went literally running because they were waiting for me at will call to get the tickets, to, you know, and it's not a good impression to be really late that your first meeting. And I was halfway, I was a shortcut through one of the hotel lobbies to get to the arena. And the Lord said to me, Jay, you didn't give him five seconds. I said, Lord, I, I got a big deal going down here. I'm sure you know it, but, but, I, but I, I'm running late. This is a big deal. I've got to make a good, this could, this could, make, it, this could make it happen. He said, Jay, you, you don't even know what he's going through. Well, I've been saved long enough to know when the father is... Wanting to have a visit, <laughs> you know, you, you better just, so I just turned around and ran back and he was just pulling out and he saw me in the rear view mirror. He said, everything all right? Everything all right? I said, man, forgive me. I said, man, I'm so late for this meeting. It's a big deal. And I didn't even ask you how you're doing. You, you always take good care of me. You're always gracious. You're, you're so thoughtful. Is everything okay? And he started sobbing and got out of the car. He said, I had to put my wife of 62 years in the, in the home. She's been falling, Brother Jay, and... I couldn't pick her up. He was a war hero. He'd always been a man's man. But at a certain stage of his life, didn't have the strength, right? And here was this unbelievable great man. And he said, I couldn't even pick her up and protect her. He said, it's the worst day of my life. And I didn't give him five seconds at first. So man... We prayed together. I got the name of the home where she was. And you know, as I went running back to a meeting, the Lord taught me a great lesson. Jay, we get caught up in a lot of stuff. If you'll get the moments right, I'll take care of the rest. And I want you to know, I went to the woodshed that day. So not only must we begin to not just pray for the high school, pray for people by name. Well, I'm praying for the mayor. I'm praying for that whole city government. Well, pray for them by name. Take them to the throne by name. Do you realize that your prayers build bridges to the church? I know we think it's our preaching and singing. And by the way, I just have to take a few moments and say, Whatever you do, come back here next year for this event. This place is incredible. That music last night was a moment, amen? And they're so gracious and everybody's so helpful, so that's just uh, right here in the text. All right. But our prayers build bridges to the church, and you've got to start walking along beside our people, and especially our students. Every student is waiting to hear, and I ask you to write it down, I believe in you. You can make it. I believe God's got a plan for you. Every student is dying for someone to acknowledge them and recognize them and affirm them. And by the way, you know what I loved about the music last night? There wasn't a lot of ripped jeans and the cool band and the artistic wow stage show. We worry so much as in youth ministry about having the coolest website. Can I be honest with you? It's not working. 
That's not what young people need. You know what they need? They need the word of God from a woman of God, from a man of God, who will look them in the eye and say, you matter to me. Study the life of Jesus. I wrote some of them down. I hope you'll see it. But notice, Jesus went to the home of Peter to hear his mother-in-law. You remember that? I always wondered why, why would Peter deny Jesus three times and then I saw this. And, uh, but no, but anyway, but he went to the home. I'm just exegeting. I'm sorry. All right. I went, Jesus went to the home of Peter. What did he tell Zacchaeus? I'm coming to your house today. He went to the house of Jairus to pray over his daughter. He let that diseased, unclean woman touch him. He stopped to heal the blind men. And then he heard the sobs of a leper. And he healed them. Do you know he hung out with the crowds in the fields and on the hills, but you know what he was doing by doing that? I'm coming to you. I'm not waiting for you to come to me. I hope you have a list of some men that you're going to. Two, ladies, I hope you have a list of some families and some ladies and some homes that you're going to. I'm all about building the church. I'm all about, we need to, man, we need to fill our churches. The more services, the better. Amen and FM. But I want you to know one thing. You know what they're waiting on? Somebody to come to them, to pray for them by name. I also, you know, it's kind of interesting, by the way, uh, I left my phone back there, but uh, I want you to know that when you watch what's happening at the border, you ever see the reporters? And they have what they call Google app. It's a translator app. You ever seen some of the interviews? Where are you from? And then it'll put it in their language. Google will. They just speak, where are you from? And then they'll hold it out there and it plays, you know, in their language. Uh, and what's your name? And, what, and then they'll say what country they're from, and he'll be able to, it's translated into English. And they go back and forth. It's an amazing thing to see. See, it's the Google app. But you know what I believe with all my heart, and I wish I'd have known this years ago? You want to know the app? It's you. You're the app. I'm the app. I'm grateful for all the tools and all the toys and all the advances, but we're the app that people need somebody. The more high-tech we become, the more high-touch we have to be. Kids today, you can't get them off their phone. They can if you walk up and start talking to them. And you don't have to worry about being cool and hip. Just care about them, man. You see they play ball? Talk about ball. You know they like wrestling? You want to talk to them about the nature boy, right? You know, you're WrestleMania, right? And, and so, but it's high touch. And so I simply remind you, I've spoken in 10,000 high schools. I've never seen young people going through what they're going today. It's the caring one like you, Pastor. It's the caring one like you, youth pastor. And by the way, uh, I, somebody asked me the other day what I'd be if I wasn't Southern Baptist with all the nonsense going on. You ever get asked that? What would you be if you weren't Southern? I'd be ashamed. <laughs> My father in the ministry was an associational missionary. My early opportunities was a Baptist pastor who took a chance on the kid with hair still down to here who'd give his testimony. I was turned down by 13 colleges. <laughs> Some reason a police record and grades, you know, it was a big deal. But finally, <laughs> there was Baptist College in Charleston, now Charleston Southern University, took a chance on me. My whole life, I could spend an hour telling you that everything I've ever done, everything I've ever had, everything I hope to do or have, the fingerprints of Southern Baptists are all over 
this kid that was a throwaway kid, the junkie kid, the detention center kid, the kid nobody wanted in the foster homes. And I want you to know, I would be ashamed if I wasn't Southern Baptist. The number one method of Satan, and I have to hurry here, so let's boogie. Write down normalization. You know what Satan is doing? His number one method is to normalize things that used to be an abomination. Teen Vogue magazine devoted several pages and a lesson plan to teach students. Listen to me. They have a lesson plan. Step one, step two, homework. Uh, talk to a friend about this. Go to this site. A lesson plan to help teenagers with bisexuality, homosexuality, pansexual behavior. They're saying it's all normal. You owe it to yourself to investigate, to explore, to try things, and find your true self. Teen Vogue magazine. All of that is normal. It must be explored. We've got educators in our public schools. We even have those in our, in our government. We have those in high positions today in our country that have an agenda to help students accept and adapt to the ginger changes, no matter how invasive it is to their personal beliefs. Anybody remember the term imago Deo? We're made in his image, male or female. That's our standard. We're created in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26. Students have to gain ownership of their own being. That's why we spend so much time at student leadership on biblical worldview. This isn't an option. It's not a heady good thing. It's not a fad. It's the only hope our kids have is how they look at themselves and look at, at the world through the lens of a biblical worldview. There are daring, dangerous temptations, and it results in debilitating shame. I went and heard the Eagles the other night doing a little research, <laughs> and they sang a song called Hotel California, and there was a line in there. You can check out any time you want, but what? Never leave. It's good to see the spiritual folks here. And uh, <laughs> I was just there doing research. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> did you get a T-shirt or anything? Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so hear me. You know what's happening to our kids? They're checking it out, but they're finding out they can't ever leave it. And there's only the saving, delivering power. These are daring, dangerous temptations resulting in debilitating shame. So we got the normalization of marijuana. Do you know I was accused by Southern Baptists, many leading pastors, many officials, that if I didn't quit telling everybody that marijuana was going to be legal one day, Jay, there's no evidence of that. It'll never happen. It's over the top. You're making a big deal out of that. I said, listen to me. In the last days, there'll be lovers of money more than themselves, lovers of pleasure. More. And do you know what? We have made marijuana normalized. It's legal. It's multi-billion dollar. So every time they even try to smoke a, a joint, now it's laced with fentanyl. And fit, you know 114,000 have died in the last two years from fentanyl? Do you realize it's 100 times more deadly than morphine? It's 50 times more deadly than heroin. These things play for keeps. They go online. They look at all these flames. I call them flames. And then they get burned and consumed by a roaring fire. You remember the fire on Maui? Normally, you can tell where a, a fire started. The little fire that started the destruction of Maui, especially Lahaina, guess what? It was such a small fire, it didn't even leave. They don't know where it started. It's a small fire, and they go to TikTok. And you know, you've heard all this. You're hearing about what's going on on the news, but I just want to remind you, they're looking for a quick fix, but it's quicksand. And you can get physically addicted to TikTok. 
And you have no idea what they're being taught. Satan warns, your, the Bible says your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I said earlier that you could be the bridge to your church. I said you should be the app for this generation. I want to give you another one to think about. Your church should be the foster home for all these kids that nobody really has time for. We got cyberbullying. You know, 56% of teenagers from 13 to 17, they've been cyberbullied. Threats, being mocked, made fun of. And do you realize, I'm going to give you this last statistic. Let me give you the number. Do you know that there were 50,000 Americans who died last year by suicide? And for every completed suicide by a young person, it's estimated that 100 to 200 attempts were made. You and I have to be the one who walks into their life and says, we care for you, we love you, and we want you to know there's hope for your world. Why do people cut themselves? You ever seen a cutter? You know why? So that what they have inside them will come out. That's, they, they just want to get that out. That's what Satan's doing. And you and I have the only hope. And I don't know if you're urban. I don't know if your church is rural. But I don't think it matters. The roaring lion is walking around. I close with this. Thank you for your patience. I close with this. One of my favorite things is to take students on our SOU trips when we go to Europe. We go to Normandy and then we go to Paris, but take them to Rodin's Sculpture Garden. I like it when they stand in front of the gates of hell. I like them when I show them that the thinker is staring at the gates of hell. What's that guy thinking about? Number one, who stole his, <laughs> his pants? Number one, I mean, that's no fun. On, but anyway, sitting on the rock. But he's looking at the gates of hell. That's what... Rodin, that's why the thinker's on the actual gates of hell, but the giant statue of the thinker is staring at the gates of hell. And I take our students there, and I go early to spend some time, make sure I'm ready to pour into these kids. And I close with this. I heard a lady come running out of one of the museum offices, and she was screaming in French. And obviously, I didn't understand French, so I quickly asked, and everybody was upset and everybody was scrambling. You know what she was yelling? The hand of God is missing. The hand of God is missing. And Rodin always made several copies of his sculptures. And that's why they're in several museums and they're originals. But he, he was one of the first to really come up with being able to make a copy of his work. And in Buenos Aires, somebody had stolen the hand of God. But I think you felt the same thing in your heart when you heard that, that I felt. The hand of God is missing. Pastors, our youth pastors are the least mentored, least discipled. A lot of them are the least educated. The church is not investing to help them go to school. They're the least mentored, they're the least uh, discipled, least uh, compensated. You know, most of the youth pastors that I have in my home, first thing they say, I've never been in a preacher's home. I've never been in my pastor's home. Men, ladies, this is the now generation. Pour yourself into those reaching students. Get alone with God and ask God this question. And let's be honest. Is the hand of God missing? And when you look at what's happening to America, what these next months are going to be like, you, you look at where we are kind of in a balance, and not just America, but the world. Listen, the hand of God is missing. And with all my heart, Dear Lord, please, I don't want it missing on me. If that's your prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand and let's pray right now.
that the Lord God will put his hand heavy upon us. He'll never remove it. He'll put his hand on our church, our ministry, help us reach our young people. Lord Jesus, may your hand never be removed from us. Lord, we, we got a lot on us. We're doing our best, but Lord, we're, we need a fresh touch. We need to be filled with your spirit. We need the passion of Jesus and help us to reach this generation because it's all we got. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, man. God bless you.